Uh, hello and welcome everybody to this online uh, event, another event by the Hellenic Observatory here at the London School of Economics, um, an online uh, research seminar uh, and part of the uh, events program of uh, the, the public events program of the London School of Economics. Our seminar today uh, is on the topic of evaluating the impact of labor market reforms in Greece during the 2010-2018. Uh, which is the period of the adjustment programs uh, in Greece. And we're very, very pleased to have uh, with us uh, to present his research, uh, Professor Nikos, uh, Nikos Vetas, uh, who I'm going to briefly introduce uh, uh, before passing on the floor uh, to him. Uh, Professor Nikos Vetas is Professor of Economics at the Athens University of Economics and Business, but he's also General Director of the Foundation for Economic and Industrial Research, uh, EOV Institute uh, in Athens. He has a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania, and he is taught previously before going to Athens uh, as uh, associate professor at Duke University. Uh, he has served uh, as uh, associate editor in the International Journal of Inter Industrial Organization. He's a research fellow at the Center for Economic Policy Research, a member of the executive committee of the European Association for Research in Industrial Economics. Uh, he's, associate ed ed he's been associate editor of the Journal of European Economic Association, and of the General of Industrial Economics. He's uh, been a member of the Hellenic Competition Commission and also in the Economic Advisory Group for Competition Policy for the European uh, Commission. Also involved in a great institution for doctoral studies in Greece, the Conference for Research on Economic Theory and Econometrics, a, a very important uh, annual conference that happens obviously every year uh, in nice locations uh, in Greek islands. Uh, he has published uh, widely in very uh, important economics journals in his field uh, of uh, industrial, uh, industrial economics, including the International Economic Review, European Economic Review, the RAND uh, Journal of Economics, and the Review of Economic Studies. Also, he is uh, quite known to people uh, studying the austerity programs in Greece and the adjustment programs uh, as a co-editor of the uh, of the 2017 book Beyond Austerity Reform in the Greek Economy, which was published uh, by the MIT uh, Press. The work that uh, Professor Vetas will be presenting today relates, as he will, I'm sure he will tell us, relates to a research project uh, that he's been running uh, with a, a number of colleagues and which has been funded by the Hellenic Observatory. Uh, and for that, uh, I think we should. Uh, uh, also acknowledge the financial support uh, for the research schemes that we run here at the Hellenic Observatory, the financial support by Dr. Vasilis Apostolopoulos and the Lascaridis Foundation. Uh, the project uh, that uh, Professor Vedas will report was on the uh, evaluating the labor market reforms in Greece, uh, but we cover not only economics topics, but the wider topics uh, um, of relevance to Greece and the wider region where Greece is located. Now, before I pass on the floor, and apologies for the uh, longest introduction, uh, a couple of announcements. For those using Twitter, uh, the hashtag for today's event is uh, hashtag LSE Greece. And the event is being recorded. Hopefully, it will be made available as a pod podcast if we don't have any technical difficulties. So you should be aware when, um, uh, 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 if you want to, the type of questions you want to ask. The questions. We will follow the presentation. We will receive uh, questions from the audience through the uh, chat uh, function of Zoom. You can submit them there. If you're listening from uh, Facebook, I think there's a facility also to submit your questions uh, through Facebook, and they will come uh, to me. I will address the questions to the speaker, and then we'll try to address, to ask, to answer, or to engage with as many questions uh, as possible. Uh, so from Facebook, you can add your questions as comments. Uh, on Zoom, you can ask your questions to the uh, Q&A function uh, on, on the bottom of, of your screen. So I hope we'll have a lively and uh, uh, interesting debate. But uh, first, uh, the very uh, exciting presentation by Professor Vetas. Nico, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Vasily. I'm, I'm very happy and honored to be part of uh, this lecture series. Um, as you said, this uh, draws on uh, a research uh, project that is being supported by the Hellenic Observatory. So I'm grateful uh, to you and, uh, the, and, and the donors, uh, Vasilis Apostolopoulos and the Lascaridis Foundation. Um, I can now jump into the presentation, uh, which is on a topic that is uh, that, that still 
um, attracts a lot of heated debate um, as to what worked and what hasn't worked about labor market reforms in Greece. Um, labor market reforms were, um, I guess, along with pensions, the, the two central and more um, controversial and uh, po po politically also hot uh, reform areas uh, during the three consecutive programs in Greece. Uh, in, in some sense, uh, labor market reforms received more attention early on, uh, around uh, 2012 uh, and 2014 was most of the action. Uh, pension reforms uh, actually uh, followed on um, mostly a little bit later. Um, despite the importance, there hasn't been much research about what worked and what hasn't worked. Uh, partly because this is this is a difficult question. Uh, we, we try to describe what happened and then tackle this question by building certain counterfactuals. In other words, if certain parts of reforms hadn't taken place, what would have happened? Uh, naturally, um, our approach, like every such approach, has a number of limitations um, about general equilibrium effects, about how you build these counterfactuals and so on and so forth. Let me try to um, share my screen. Um, so hopefully now you, you, you can see my slides. Um, and let me start with the important part, uh, which is that uh, this research is joined um, with uh, three colleagues uh, George Gatopoulos, uh, Alejandros Luca, and uh, Yanis uh, Polikarpu. Uh, each one of them knows a lot more about uh, empirical work and labor markets than myself. So, uh, I'm, you know, I, b b bear with me as I'm going to go through uh, a, a labor market uh, paper uh, with empirical stuff, which is not exactly my um, bread and butter. Um, still, I think there is uh, some interesting stuff here. Uh, I'm going to preempt some of the criticism by saying that what we have here is not the last word on the topic, but we are opening up some discussion. So uh, the context here is that uh, Greece went through three consecutive bailout programs. Uh, during which there was legislation and implementation, these are not always in Greece the same thing, of uh, various reforms. Uh, and there was a dual um, aim of those, uh, fiscal sustainability and then uh, building external competitiveness for, for the economy. And in terms of structural reforms, Whereas there was an initial ambition to also tackle product market reforms, um, it is clear that labor market reforms uh, were deeper um, and started also earlier, at least in terms of implementation. So it's important to understand what these reforms uh, did. Uh, that's exactly the objective of this research here. Um, what was the, first of all, to evaluate the impact of these labor market reforms on the incentives at a microeconomic level of individuals um, to enter the formal labor market. Uh, we're gonna focus on this because as you may or you may not know, uh, Greece has a very sizable informal labor market. And the boundaries between the two are, are crucial, especially during a crisis period when the incentives change. Uh, then we have uh, a supplementary approach, which is to estimate the impact of those reforms on um, some macro indicators. So we're gonna combine a micro and a, and a macro um, approach. So the first, the first approach is going to be on uh, building simulations at the level of households. And then you compare whether the household, what, how these reforms affected incentives of the household to participate or not to participate. The second approach is more top down. 
And then we built um, what is called generalized synthetic control method, which allows to structure counterfactual paths. Basically ask if some particular reforms hadn't taken place and we start with 2012, um, what would happen, what would have happened? And then we compare the actual with those counterfactuals. Now, the stylized facts on the Greek labor market are actually quite interesting. Uh, here they are uh, very briefly outlined in terms of bullets. Uh, relative to uh, European comparisons, uh, the Greek labor market exhibits low productivity. We also saw, and that's uh, actually a well-documented uh, fact, that the unit labor cost, uh, what we refer here at uh, ULC, increased higher than productivity in the pre-crisis period. According to many researchers, this was a significant um, ingredient of what led to the crisis. But there are also additional um, structural features of, of this market. One is a low participation rate. Uh, participation rate is systematically low uh, in Greece relative to um, other European economies, especially when it comes to uh, women and uh, younger people. In addition, unemployment rate was high in Greece even before the crisis period. So even before 2008, uh, in Greece, we had systematically higher unemployment than in comparison countries. The tax wedge, no matter how you measure it, was significantly high. Uh, is, has been significantly high. Uh, flexible, unemployment, flexible employment force um, were of very low use during the pre-crisis period. So it's interesting to see what happened after the crisis started. Uh, there was a very significant mismatch that has been documented between demand and supply in, in the market and uh, very limited outreach of vocational and educational uh, programs and training. The informal labor market has been uh, very uh, strong in Greece and a very high share of self-employment, uh, the highest in Europe. So if you combine all this, this builds uh, a labor market picture that is not exactly what you see in, in, in an average uh, European uh, country. Now, let me now talk about this feature that I mentioned before. Um, that uh, basically in, in one sentence, uh, we can say that wages grew faster than productivity in the pre-crisis, in the pre-2008 uh, period. Uh, basically, you see that in, in each of these panels, these, these are different ways to measure pretty much the same thing. So on, on the top left panel, we see the nominal unit labor cost. Uh, all these are measurements that actually we did not create. They, they come from uh, Ameco. Um, nominal unit labor cost is defined as the ratio of compensation per employee to real GDP per person employed. And all the other comparisons are kind of self-explanatory. Basically, we see that wages grew faster than productivity going towards uh, 2008. And then there was a correction. Um, in each of those uh, comparisons, basically, there are two things uh, moving at the same time. One is uh, wages, the other is productivity. Okay, so, so this is one. Uh, the, the second systematic feature of the Greek labor markets is what I mentioned before, uh, low uh, labor participation. Um, Participation in the labor market obviously is not the same thing as employment. Uh, these are the people who are in principle uh, willing to work. Um, and basically, you, so regardless of whether they are employed or they are unemployed, and basically we see that participation, um, if, if you focus on the top left panel, 
you see that labor force participation has been growing in Greece. Um, however, it lags behind uh, the EU average and in fact, most European economies. The increase that we see is driven more, mainly by what you see at the top right panel, which is an increase in the, in the female um, labor force participation, which has been going up. Uh, although that one is significantly lagging behind the European uh, averages. Um, interestingly, uh, if you look at uh, top down, you see um, labor force participation for uh, young people. And this over years, over the years has been decreasing, um, probably reflecting, uh, I'm just describing the data here, uh, probably reflecting an increased willingness um, to stay uh, at school longer. So this can be um, uh, education um, at a higher level um, at, at different uh, institutions, uh, postgraduate or, or, or graduate. Uh, whereas we see, uh, interestingly enough, in the bottom right panel, uh, the participation rate for people over 50 um, we also see that this participation rates uh, after the crisis started, so basically after 2010, instead of going up uh, for about five years or six, it was going down. Part of the reason for that must have been that um, reform in the pensions system that made it um, less uh, less of a good uh, bargain to, to stay at work. Uh, people were trying to, to retire before, um, before the system would become less advantageous uh, for them. So basically what we see is uh, labor force participation uh, lagging behind the EU uh, benchmarks. Uh, that, that's the total. And that, that's something to keep in mind because when we evaluate the impact of the reforms, we're gonna say some good things and some bad things about the outcomes. Um, and one of the bad things we're going to say, one of the negative outcomes is that really we haven't tackled in Greece this problem of the systematically low labor force participation. Now, uh, part, uh, an, an important bit that complements this picture is a tax wedge. Now the tax wedge again can be, uh, can be measured in a number of ways. What we have on the left is we put on the, um, on the numerator, the total that is withheld uh, for social security. Uh, so the social security contributions is not just for pensions, it's also for, for healthcare, uh, unemployment and so on and so forth. The numerator has uh, the gross wage um, of, of, of the individual. So basically you see Greece having uh, a higher ratio of, of that relative to uh, the Eurozone, relative to the OECD average, uh, relative to Spain and Portugal. Now another comparison that you could make that's a little bit different. On the right, we see um, the average tax wedge. So here we, we, we subtract not only social security contributions, but also, also income taxes. And we put in the denominator, uh, the total of labor costs. So this is not the gross uh, wage, this is what the employer pays. And, and again, uh, we actually see that uh, Greece is the top line. So according to that metric, um, the burden uh, the, of, of this tax wedge is uh, more severe in Greece than in pretty much every comparison that you have made. Now, one little thing that you can see is that during the 2012-2015 period, uh, there has been signs that this gap has been narrowing. Uh, you can see this on the right panel and on the left panel. However, uh, this progress has been stalled since then. So that's, that's another important feature of the Greek uh, la labor market. Um, high tax wedge, uh, low labor force participation. An, an additional feature that is 
uh, important to document uh, is about flexible forms of employment, uh, which in Greece has had uh, limited uh, outreach. So we see that part part-time employment uh, has been increasing over the years uh, around the crisis in Greece. Um, but Greece still remains the bottom of all the lines to which we are comparing on the left, um, with also with some fatigue in this uh, from 2017. Um, and it's also interesting that when people are asked uh, about the nature of this part-time employment, they say this is involuntary. Okay, so this is much more in Greece than pretty much uh, anywhere else in the comparison. In other words, those who are working part-time, uh, they, they don't like it, uh, much less than in, in the rest of Europe. Um, so this, this, is done, this is not, in some sense, something that is considered uh, normal or, or part of how the economy should work, that part of the employment uh, could be part-time but more like a, an anomaly uh, that, that uh, should be avoided. Now, th this is a little bit hard to explain exactly why, um, but according to the measurement we have, uh, looks like average working hours in Greece, uh, this is for wage earners. So this is, this is living out um, self-employment but this is on average high. So we see this for the um, full-time wage earners and the part-time wage earners. Um, it is hard to, to distinguish exactly what are the factors that are driving this. Um, there was actually a negative trend pre-crisis. So people were working less and less. You see it starts above 40 hours uh, per week and then it was going down uh, below 40 hours. I'm, I'm sorry, it was going just, uh, it was starting about 41 hours per week on average, going a little bit lower than 40 hours per week, but then it has gone up uh, more. Th this may mean, uh, this may be because um, the market works in such a way that it tries uh, to pay overtime to currently employed people rather than perhaps to hire more people but this is something that uh, actually is interesting and demands uh, more uh, study and more data. But uh, actually it would, be, um, it, it would be a mistake to describe the labor markets in Greece without noticing that Greece has uh, a very high share of self-employment. Uh, basically you see here, this is uh, self-employed people as a percentage of uh, total labor force. Uh, it's around 25% of the total labor force. Um, this is not actually a percentage of those who do work. If you do it as a percentage of those who do work, the percentage is actually even higher, right? Here in the denominator, we also put people who are um, unemployed. Um, this high percentage continued even after the labor market reforms, um, despite the fact that we saw a convergence uh, with other uh, peers in, in Europe during the period 2012 and 2015, in, just to put it in simple terms, during those years, um, self-employment was actually hit. Uh, notice that uh, this includes also employment in the public sector which was actually not um, uh, hit much uh, when it came to permanent public sector employees. Now, so th this is kind of uh, a nice, I think, set of uh, pictures for the Greek labor markets. Let us now turn to what was the set of, of reforms um, in, during the programs. Uh, as I said previously, these reforms primarily took place early on in the programs. Uh, with, with, um, with their peak in 2012 and 2014. They had uh, a twofold objective to uh, support the adjustment in the economy through more flexible uh, labor market uh, regulations. 
and to enhance gains in cost and competitiveness. Um, the, the, the latter is also, can also be understood in what uh, has been called the process of internal devaluation, uh, since the Greek economy could not gain competitiveness through uh, a currency devaluation, uh, internal devaluation was a path that was um, uh, selected. So uh, here I'm just being descriptive. I'm not arguing uh, what was wrong or what was right. Now, uh, going back to what was uh, the first of the two objectives described here, the idea was to, um, when the crisis hit, and we're talking about a huge crisis that, that actually was more, more than one fourth of the Greek GDP actually was wiped out uh, during these uh, first crisis years. So the, the, the real GDP declined by more than 25% uh, cumulatively. Um, so the rationale was uh, to assist the adjustment in the labor market so that the adjustment would take place uh, to a larger extent through prices than, than through volumes. Okay, to put this um, in a less uh, politically correct manner, um, that the adjustment would take place more by not having people going to unemployment, but decreasing their wages. And um, during the, the idea was that this would actually facilitate the, the landing of the economy during the crisis, but would also lead to a faster unemployment recovery uh, once the economy actually returns uh, to, to, to growth. The second of these objectives, as I said, was uh, to um, strengthen cost competitiveness. In other words, that uh, Greek businesses would, would, would find uh, labor uh, cheaper and um, it's, it is a documented fact that during the first decade of the Euro adoption, the Greek economy price competitiveness uh, significantly weakened during the Euro area average, um, during also most of the Eurozone periphery. And in the absence, as I mentioned before, of an exchange rate uh, mechanism, uh, reducing or more flexibility in the labor market was viewed as a tool that would actually uh, lead to uh, increased uh, competitiveness and fast. So there were four, uh, I'm sorry, there were five uh, key areas for labor reforms and those were distinct. Um, collective bargaining, national minimum uh, wage, not age, apologies for the typo, uh, employment uh, protection, uh, flexible forms of employment, and the labor tax wage. Now, in terms of collect, let me say a word about uh, each one of those. Um, I'm, I'm going to be quick uh, because the point is to go to an evaluation of what this did. Uh, basically, collective bargaining uh, increased flexibility in the system. It made it more decentralized um, in a sense that uh, bargaining at the firm level would, would often take priority uh, over what might have been at a higher level. Uh, once uh, the, the relevant workers and uh, employers were able uh, to agree. Now, the, the overall, the, the point here was to facilitate adjustment again, as I said before, via wages rather than volume. In other words, not to lead to a drastic, to, a, to an even more drastic increase in unemployment, but to keep people employed even at lower wages. Then there was um, a change in the, in the national minimum wage. The idea here was twofold was first of all in one-off significant decrease in the minimum wage that took uh, place early on in the program um, so that to avoid uh, especially lower skilled people uh, being priced out of the formal labor market and moved into the shadow market and then there was also a new mechanism put in put, that was put in place 
where there was a trilateral participation, um, not just the social partners, but also involved the government, um, so that there was also a representation of those who were the outsiders in the labor market. So there was a one-off significant decrease in the minimum wage, but then there was also um, a, a new mechanism that was um, different than before that was put in, in place. There were also changes in employment protection. Greece had quite rigid rules about um, uh, laying people off. So these reforms increased the, facilitated the, form, the, the firm's um, responsiveness to economic cycle at the extensive margin. This means in other words, that it became easier for firms to fire people uh, in, in two ways. First of all, the compensation the firms had to give in order to fire people were uh, diminished on average. And second, the percentage of the employees that one could uh, fire at a given year increased. So the idea here, at least initially, was that this lower, um, that this increased flexibility would actually encourage uh, firms to hire more people because it would then be um, harder, it, it would be easier to fire them if it turned out that uh, actually this employment uh, was no longer uh, needed. That was the, the idea. Um, then you went to flexible forms of, of employment in the sense of uh, part-time uh, work, um, increase the ability to shift uh, over time and so on and so forth. Um, the idea here again is that to make it uh, easier to work in the, in the formal labor uh, market rather than the informal labor market. And finally, there is all these ideas about lowering the, this very high labor tax wedge. Uh, this was something, everything else that I said before was uh, and still is one way or, or another controversial. And you are going to find people at both sides of the argument if this was in principle correct or if this was in principle a bad idea and also whether in practice it worked or in practice it was a bad idea. Now this fifth element decreasing the tax wedge was something that everybody in the labor market is going to tell you it's a good idea because this benefits the employers as well as the employees. Uh, the only thing is that this has a fiscal cost. Um, but, but we do so that this fiscal cost actually was a significant part of, of, the, of, of, of what worked in practice, um, both in terms of what um, helped the labor market and, and, and more broadly. Uh, now, this is a list of exactly what happened. I'm not going to go through it. Just notice the years. Uh, most of what happened was around 2012 and then another series of reforms in 2014 that I'm going to mention uh, for, so, so that I don't uh, overburden, I don't go through this list. This is a little bit of a record of, of what actually did happen. Now uh, I'm going to go in, in turn to two approaches uh, that we have um, with my colleagues uh, adapted in this project. First, a micro level approach, and then uh, a macro, more top down uh, approach. Um, the, the results of each actually nicely complement each other. Um, in, in one particular area, um, both give you the, the same result as we're going to see. And then we're going to conclude. Now, the, the micro level approach actually uh, builds on employment incentives. So it goes to the level of, um, of, of the individual and basically ask what are the incentives to work and for that matter to work uh, in the formal uh, labor market uh, in, in Greece. Um, basically what we do is we construct um, a micro founded proxy for the counter incentives of employment. Put it differently, we ask um, under different uh, policy regimes, 
uh, what is it that I gain if I do work in the formal market and what it is that I do if I do not work in the formal market and I become um, unemployed. This is basically the comparison. Um, we compare how these incentives have evolved during the programs, um, but also across individual and household characteristics, because the effect was not the same for all, for all of those. Uh, then we turn to a particular year, 2014, when, when we had an interesting um, experiment, a natural experiment from the viewpoint of the economist, as there was a reduction in the employee's social security contributions by one uh, percentage point. Um, th this happened once, and we can actually uh, simulate what was the effect that this had on, on employment uh, in incentives. We do need to have changes that take place on the employee side in order to be able to talk about employment uh, in, in incentives. Now, uh, a little bit more about uh, some detail now about how this works. Um, we are employing a tool called uh, Euromode. Um, those of you uh, working in uh, labor economics, in, at least with European uh, markets, uh, you may be familiar with that. This is a micro simulation model, uh, has been um, developed by the European Commission and uh, the University of Essex. And what it does is uh, it applies different changes in tax and um, benefits uh, policies. Uh, so it fixes the, the policy system within a year and then it simulates how uh, taxes, benefits, uh, social security contributions and disposable income to each uh, household after the system rules uh, change. So this is what that is. Uh, the data that is being used uh, is micro data at the household level. Um, this is what is called uh, SILK. Uh, it's being coordinated by the European Union. So this is the European level statistics on income and living conditions. Um, and we, we have that for Greece. This is collected in each country and then it's being coordinated centrally. Um, and we can apply a number of filters here. Um, in this exercise, we're going to focus on the wage earners. So we can isolate from the whole data set uh, this category of uh, individuals. In particular, we are going to simulate, uh, we have simulated uh, the components that uh, impact labor market participation incentives at the extensive margin. Um, and those are uh, taxes uh, that have to be paid, benefits received, social insurance uh, contributions that need to be paid, as well as labor earnings. This here is um, a description of, of uh, the data sample that we have. It, it is quite large. Uh, for 2008, it's a little bit short than uh, 2,000 uh, people. Um, you can see here the characteristics in, in case this you are interested. This, this is not a panel. This is, this is a repeated cross-section. Um, and from that data set, we're going to select uh, the ones that we are interested in. Um, the main instrument that we're going to work with, uh, we are construct uh, this formula that you see, which is called participation tax rate. So the participation tax rate basically tries to measure, as I said before, what you, what, how much you benefit if you decide to go on one side of the line rather than the other side of the line. So this measures, this is a proxy for employment counter incentives. For instance, if unemployment benefits are extremely high in any given country, uh, uh, and set a risparibus, this would actually show that the incentives uh, to work would be actually quite high, quite low. Uh, in particular, this is defined as the share of the gross uh, labor income. This is actually on, at, the, at the denominator. And in the numerator, we have the difference between the household's disposable income when the individual is employed 
minus the disposable income of that individual if, if he or she is unemployed. So we have micro data because obviously uh, wages and uh, social security and taxes and all that, they are not the same for each individual. So this is in some sense, the strength of, of, of silk and, and euro mode. Um, and uh, we can actually proceed with that. So, so here is one big picture to th that is of interest. Nico, very sorry to interrupt. Uh, just to give you 10 minutes warning, if you, uh, uh, you can cover, make sure you cover the whole presentation. So 10, 12 minutes, we should be. Yes, great. Thank you, Vasily. So, so here is one big picture to take away. Basically, you can see that uh, this participation tax rate in 2018, so this is light blue relative to 2010, which is dark blue, uh, increased. We see this across all income deciles, and we actually see this also across all income groups. This basically means that the counter incentives for employment increased, not decreased, during 2012-2018. Uh, we also see that when you compare light blue with dark blue, that this the difference is stronger when it comes to people for, at uh, low income decile and people at low um, at, at, at low uh, ages, at, at younger ages. Uh, and we can also do this for female versus male population. Basically, this was stronger for younger male population. Um, th this, this can have an, a number of explanations, but basically it shows that if you consider everything that took place in the eight years after 2010, the incentives to work actually went uh, the, the other way. Now, one particularly uh, interesting variable that contributed to that was obviously the fact that the disposable income went down. So here you see the disposable income. Uh, th this is not in the whole of Greece. This is in the sample that we have. Um, you, you see a very huge drop for people not familiar with the Greek crisis. These numbers seem un unbelievable. But basically, you see on average disposable income going down uh, during these eight years by about 25%. This was as a result of the fiscal consolidation measures, the higher unemployment, the, the increased taxes, um, and so on and so forth. So uh, th this is one thing that we see. Now, then we focus on 2014. In 2014, we have we had one particular reform, which was that there was one item uh, within the social security contributions of the that the employees were paying. This was decreased by one percentage point. Uh, so this creates a nice natural experiment, and we can simulate what happened uh, with this data set before and after. So we estimate the participation tax rate prior and after this 1% this decrease. Um, and basically, we see what happened in the disposable income as a result of that. This is a total disposable income um, of, of the household. So on average, this decreased a little bit less than 1%. This is also because Yes, maybe the social security contribution decreased by 1%, but this now becomes taxable income. So part of that was taxed and it was taken away fr from the household. So you can, you can simulate this across the income uh, uh, deciles. So this goes from 0.4% to 1.2%. Um, however, we now interestingly see that the count the counter incentives for employment as a result of this 2014 reform actually uh, dropped and they dropped significantly. Okay, they dropped for for every income decile and for every age group. Uh, this is not surprising because this is actually now more money in your pocket if you do work relative or if you don't work. But we actually quantify how much that was, and this is interesting because uh, both during the programs but also exposed there hasn't been much of an estimate of how much each of these reforms contributed or not contributed.
You can do other things. Um, we can combine with a separate study that we have done at UOV um, about a year ago, where we estimated an elasticity that translates this participation tax rate into um, labor force participation. And if you do all this and you believe this elasticity of 0.75 percentage points, this basically says that this 1% decrease uh, in the social security contribution that took place in 2014 increased labor force participation by about 0.4 percentage points. Now, is this large, is this small? Well, um, given that participation rates in the labor force market in Greece have been lagging behind the European average by about four percentage points, uh, 0.4 percent is, is not huge. Um, and in fact, if you, if you run the simulation, you see that for female and younger population, uh, the improvement is even less. However, it is something, it, it is sizable, and we can actually show that this one uh, worked. Now let's go to the uh, complementary approach in, in our study, which is a macro approach. Um, uh, even though we, we, this is macro, it refers to macro variables. We don't actually build here uh, a macroeconomic model. However, what we do um, is uh, we put Greece in the context uh, of a cross country level uh, study. And we estimate counterfactual paths for selected macro uh, and other social indicators if those labor market reforms would not take place. Uh, as we argue in the paper, which I guess after some comments will become uh, soon available, this is a better, uh, this is an approach that works better than a more standard diff in diff um, approach uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, this generalized synthetic control method um, follows four steps um, that uh, are actually uh, outlined here. And let me actually, the number of, of caveats one, one can say, uh, one can describe. Uh, however, there are reasons to believe that this works uh, better than some alternatives. Uh, this method uh, has been used by the IMF to evaluate similar reforms in Spain uh, recently. Let me jump to the conclusions. So um, I would like, okay, for each one of the, of the slides, I'm, I'm going to show to you um, what I have on the left is actually uh, three uh, countries together, Greece, Portugal, and Spain. So I'm running this for the three countries uh, together. And then on the right, uh, I have Greece. Um, what you see before 2012 is actually fitting the model to the data. What you see after 2012 is actually um, generating a counterfactual about what would have happened if these labor, labor market reforms had not taken place. And here I'm talking about all the labor market reforms that took place in 2012. So I'm not isolating um, one of them. So um, also just to note before I embark on describing the results, that uh, like all econometrics works better locally. So after you go away, if the, the more away you go from 2012, I, I, the less I, I should believe uh, my results, uh, the closer I stay around 2013, 14, 15, uh, the more robust these results uh, are. So one thing that we, so, so, so how should you read this? So look, for example, at the right panel and you see the, the solid line. The solid line is exactly what happened. And now we're talking about uh, employment growth uh, in percentage terms. And the dotted line is the path that employment would have followed if the reforms would, ha would not have taken place. So in some sense here, you say the reforms worked. Okay, by, by doing all of these things that we described, the um, employment growth um, actually was stronger than what it would have taken place if the reforms were not implemented. Okay, the, the solid line is higher than the dotted line. Then, then we look at separately at unemployment. 
Um, and here again, you see that unemployment in Greece would have been higher uh, if the reforms would not have taken place. Uh, similar is also true for when you do it for the three kind, countries um, together, combined at, at the left. Um, here, however, you see something a little bit different. Here is labor force participation. So the participation rate, but this is estimated on, on a, with a top-down, a, a macro approach, uh, different from the micro approach we, we had before. And actually here you see that if the reforms, um, if, if the reforms had not uh, taken place, uh, you see the solid line now is below uh, the dotted line. So labor force participation would have been higher. How do you explain this? It also has to do with the path that uh, wages followed, uh, that in, in fact, disposable income followed. In some sense, whereas unemployment benefits decreased during the crisis, incomes, if you are working, decreased even more. And that's the difference that drives uh, the, this gap. Um, then you can also estimate what happened uh, with part-time employment. Uh, here you also see that if the 2012 reforms would not have taken place, uh, part-time employment would have been less. So in some sense here you see a success of, of, of the program. Um, here is the average hours worked. Uh, for uh, people that are working full time. This is a little bit harder to, to explain, especially when you see that in, uh, uh, that in Spain and Portugal, the results uh, were different, but basically you see that at least according to their self-reporting, average hours worked in Greece um, when, went up a lot. Uh, the counterfactual would have been that they would have been uh, going down. Um, you see, I'm, I'm, I'm going away from this a little bit uh, fast because th this, this can be a really long discussion. And this is actually very interesting because uh, this is, as far as I know, the first estimate on how these labor market reforms affected the unit labor cost. Um, so basically you see that unit labor cost uh, in Greece did go down significantly during the programs. So after 2012, you, you see the very significant increase before 2012. Uh, again, we're talking about Greece, the blue line. We see that this went down significantly after 2012, but we also built this um, counterfactual that shows that it would have been much, much higher by about 10% higher um, if, if the reforms had not been taken place. So uh, this is an estimate, you, you may like it or not like it, but it, it is an estimate about uh, the effect that the 2012 reforms had on unit labor cost. Um, unit labor cost, uh, these reforms, however, on the other hand, increased um, inequality. So again, focus more about what happened the first year after 2012. You see the solid line, uh, which is what really happened after 2012 went up, uh, whereas the dotted line, which is what would have happened if the reforms had not taken place, would have been lower. So there was more, uh, this is the Gini coefficient that measures, uh, uh, measures variance uh, in, in the labor market uh, incomes. So we see that the reforms actually increase this uh, inequality in, in, in actual incomes. And, and finally, um, we, we do the same thing about the effect of this 2014 reduction in the social security contributions. Uh, and we saw that the participation rate uh, indeed increased. We, so, so this macro approach actually comes to confirm what we found from the micro approach. So the um, participation rate uh, would have been much lower if this change uh, had not taken place. So I'm concluding, uh, as I said before, we, we definitely do not claim this is the last word in evaluating the effect of labor market reforms. 
uh, one has a lot of work to do thinking about uh, a number of avenues that I'm going to describe in a second. However, um, we actually document a mixed picture. First of all, these were radical labor market reforms. Uh, so this, this gives us uh, a great opportunity from an economist viewpoint uh, to evaluate empirically. Uh, the evidence that we present suggests that one of the incentives, which was the increase in cost competitiveness and then increase in relative employment and all of that, this was largely fulfilled. So here is a check. On the other hand, um, I'm sorry, in, in, in conjunction to that, we also had in, this increased flexibility in labor market regulations um, also supported the objective um, that we're going to have a significant part of the adjustment through prices, wages, that is, than through volumes. Uh, so this is also a check. If you believe that this was an incentive uh, of the labor market reforms, yes, it contributed, it helped cost competitiveness, and yes, it, it, it helped uh, more people keep their jobs than otherwise. However, these reforms left mostly unaddressed uh, long-standing weaknesses of the Greek uh, labor market, such as the low um, labor force participation, uh, the informal market, the strong informal market, and the high tax wedge. Uh, th this, I think this set of conclusions actually can lead to a very long discussion um, as to whether in total these reforms uh, were beneficial and, and where and, and why, um, what would have been the outcomes if uh, other reforms like in the product market would have taken priority over labor market reforms, um, whether the fiscal consolidation actually contributed or not contributed to a success of the reforms in the labor market, um, I, do, I don't need to abuse your time and go more uh, one more time through the conclusions. I said this. However, it's important to think about policy priorities. Nico, um, in one minute, if you can, please. Yes, because uh, it is true that um, while significant adjustment in the labor market did take place during these uh, many years, uh, there are areas that remain where the labor markets remain structurally weak. Uh, there is a very significant mismatch uh, in skills. So demand and supply uh, don't communicate uh, well. So you, you do need to do a lot more on the front of vocational and educational training. Uh, active uh, labor market policies, uh, thinking about undeclared work. Uh, and overall, how at the same time you're going to increase uh, labor productivity, but also reduce unemployment rates and uh, inequality. Uh, there is a lot more to discuss here, but uh, Vasily, I already feel that I abuse my time. Uh, this is the set of results we have up to now, and I hope this is, uh, this is food for thought. Thank you. Nico, thank you very much. Uh, a lot of material, a wealth of material, and very interesting. Uh, in, in normal circumstances, we'd have a round of applause now uh, for at the end of the presentation, but we'll leave it uh, uh, for um, notionally afterwards at the end of the of the seminar. I would like, before opening the floor for questions and answers, to um, ask you a couple of questions while people also, as I say, collect their thoughts and type in the, the questions. We already have a few, but I'll try to. Um, give a bit more, more time. What I would like to, to ask is, uh, I imagine that would be a question that uh, a good colleague, Manolis Galignanos, would be uh, probably uh, asking, so I hope I'm not stealing his question, but you mentioned towards the end of the conclusions that uh, uh, tick box the reform seem to have uh, improved the situation with regard to cost competitiveness. And I guess if one looks at it from the uh, factual side, the price side, so unit labor cost went down, uh, so I understand uh, the argument, and of course, you know, the, the synthetic control analysis was doing that. 
But if you look at the export performance of the country, uh, at least for the um, until maybe 2016, exports hadn't picked up. And part of the explanation could be that uh, uh, you know the shock of the of the recession was so big, um, that the cash flow uh, so the companies had cash flow problems. They were very it was very difficult to um, to get credit in order to export for, to international markets. So even though the unit level cost went down, maybe the kind of collateral damage of the reforms was that it deprived the productive sector from being able to export. Um, I know this, you know, you cannot possibly comment on that on the basis of the counterfactual analysis, but would you like to um, talk a bit about that, whether the cost, com you know, so focus on cost competitiveness, uh, perhaps overlooked the other things that matter for exports, uh, which is not just the, the, the price. And then um, uh, another question that I would like to, to relate to the other conclusion about the labor force participation, and it is seemed in the presentation, I mean, obviously the reforms aimed at changing the incentives for people to participate, and you seem to focus on that in the presentation, uh, obviously for good reasons, but I guess a lot of action happened on early retirement and whatever happened with people uh, choosing to live uh, before they lose their pension entitlement. Uh, so I wonder whether uh, the results are uh, kind of consistent if you focus at, at uh, narrower age groups, uh, say people up to the age of 55, uh, that didn't have the opportunity to retire. So it is really about incentives rather than about movements of people in and out of uh, you know, big categories in the labor market. So if you would like to share any thoughts on these points. Right, Th thank you, because both points are actually quite interesting and valid. Um, let me let me start from uh, perhaps the, the second one. Um, the the exercise we're running is is the incentive to participate in the in the formal labor market, and we, we do believe this is an important exercise to run through. Um, it, it is, however, in some sense, a, a static exercise, because it looks uh, at, at any given point in time, what are the current. Um, benefits if you work and what are the benefits if you don't work. Um, you would like to build perhaps a dynamic uh, decision uh, about exiting the labor market um, uh, for, for good, go, go, going into uh, re retirement. This would show in the, in the data as to actually who uh, opted for early retirement, for instance, and, and who didn't. But that doesn't actually diminish the value of the exercise, which is the incentive to work within a given year, right? So, in fact, if we show in the data that even though um, the participation tax rate uh, was actually going the, um, the, the wrong way, people were uh, retiring, we would say, well, it is because uh, they would like to lock in a better pension uh, before the pension parameters actually but here we see that actually both go the same way. So a number of people had an incentive to go to early retirement. And at the same time, uh, people that were working in the formal labor uh, market actually um, had a weaker incentive to do this prior to before. Now, that doesn't mean this was a result of the reforms, but this was also a result of, of the crisis. This was the result of the crisis because if you did get to keep your, your, your job, you are making actually a lower um, uh, disposable uh, income than in 2018 than what you would be making in 2010. Um, but, but since you mentioned it, this is something that we are discussing with the research team, uh, building a more dynamic, this would have to be more like a, an exit model of dynamic programming uh, as to anticipating, with uncertainty, of course, because this is Greece, as to whether you would go to pension or, or, or not. That's one thing. Now, going back to the issues of competitiveness here, um, th this is a long discussion, but we do not argue that, competi that total competitiveness went up. Okay? We argue here that these reforms contributed towards competitiveness. There are other parts of, in particular, that had to do with business environment, 
and, and we do know that that part of competitiveness went, went the wrong way. And, and in most of the rankings that have to do with business environment, Greece was actually um, was in, in a retreat. Um, this had to do with uncertainty in the country. It had to do with an increased cost of financing um, and so on and so forth. So here we actually take one part. And it, it is actually well known that unit labor costs went down and contributed towards competitiveness. The unfortunate part is that there were not more variables that would contribute towards this total competitiveness. Now, having said that, it is actually um, not, not true that, and, and that's another long discussion, to, to, what, to, to what extent you would expect um, exports to go up. Um, uh, exports did go up during the programs more in some other countries like in Spain. Uh, however, in particular parts of the market, um, you do see uh, exports of goods uh, going up significantly and systematically, at least when you, when you do this in, um, in, in value. So exports of goods uh, is now much higher than when it was uh, seven or eight years back. Interestingly, this took a while. This basically says that once, the, once your domestic product markets collapse, uh, you do not necessarily find it immediate to sell abroad. Uh, you need to connect yourself within uh, international value chains. Um, you need to convince your trading partners that um, you, you are low risk so that they would start trading with you. And that was very hard for those of us who remember how Greece was during the three programs. It was not low risk. Um, so it took a number of, it took some, some years for a number of companies to find their place in, in, in global value chains, but they did. Um, and, and after that, in certain parts of the market, significantly we saw um, uh, exports uh, increasing albeit with a delay. Yeah. Thanks, Nico. I see that actually my questions are also asked by a couple of people in the audience. So I'll, I'll reiterate these questions and, and see if you would like to add something uh, on that, uh, on the same point. So there is a question by Nicolas de Mullas, who says labor market reforms were prescribed mainly to remedy the uncompetitiveness of Greek exports and to a lesser extent to facilitate import substitution. Looking back at the poor performance of the country on these grounds, even as we speak, were the measures materially effective? So going back on the question, but I guess your answer is already given that that part of the equation worked, but the other uh, contextual uh, factors and the, and the reforms did not necessarily help. Right. So, so here, here we measure the impact of uh, labor market reforms. Um, holding everything else in the equation fixed. Uh, but, but it is well known and it's kind of natural that competitiveness means a lot more than labor market reforms. Yeah. Okay, so the other one has to do again with pensions and the uh, retirees and labor force participation. So uh, Aris Nicolopoulou, PhD student at the University of Paris, uh, uh, the question, a part of public policy evaluation is also about the impact on the society in terms of living, living conditions and so forth. Do you think that the inter internal devaluation changed actually this aspect in Greece? Sorry, this is not, this is a different question than the pensions, but uh, so do you think that the, the internal devaluation changed actually the, uh, you know, the, the living conditions of people in, in Greece in the better, I guess? Well, well, as I, uh, well, as, as I said, um, in, in terms of the labor, far, mar, labor market reforms, we, we find a mixed picture and we try to separate uh, in some sense where they worked and where they didn't work. Uh, they, to, to sum up, they worked in terms of contributing towards cost competitiveness. They, 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 they worked uh, towards changing the mix between higher unemployment and lower wages. Um, but they did not work in addressing these more structural problems that I described before, the low labor force participation, the high tax wedge, and the informal, uh, the high informal um, sector. 
Now, um, in order to think uh, what was the impact of all this um, on, for, for people working in Greece, um, you have to evaluate um, the impact and then the middle run. To put it a little bit differently, um, obviously, this was a very severe crisis, as severe as we have seen in decades uh, in, in Europe. So it is absolutely natural that during these years, the average household suffered and, and suffered very severely. The questions then was, the, the questions you have to answer are two. One is to what extent the cost of this crisis, how the cost of this crisis was shared across the economy. And we, we said a few things about this. And secondly, to what extent these reforms uh, helped stop the, um, the, 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 the recession and then helped um, increase uh, GDP growth in particular through a contribution to, to exports. So that's, that, that it, it is definitely a mixed bag. Um, but if one expects an answer that says that due to these labor market reforms that happened in 2012 and 2014, this led to an increase in the absolute welfare of households. Certainly, this this did not happen. It could not have happened. Hi, Nico. I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, I can. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I, I I've been victim of uh, internet connection. So I've lost my uh, connection. Uh, but I will uh, try to continue with uh, a couple of questions. I think. Um, the, um, there was a, a question by Eleni Lurie uh, about the, the results being mostly, I guess, mainly the Euromods, the first part of microanalysis being uh, drawn, uh, as you said, for a sample of people who are um, um, in salaried employment. Uh, but also you mentioned that, uh, a, as we know, a big proportion of uh, the, the Greek labor force is self-employed. So the question was, uh, if you replicate, I guess, this analysis for the self-employed and to what extent um, what applies to the salaried people applies, um, you know, generalizes to the rest of the economy. A related question, not so much, but related to the self-employment issue by Ioannis Lalliotis uh, is about the measurement of self-employed and whether the self-employed includes uh, um, uh, professionals, uh, I guess it would be I guess, doctors, legal professionals, and, and so forth. But the question of Eleni Luri is on the, the generalizability of the... Uh, right. The so, so both questions refer to what you can do with, um, with the simulation. Uh, yes, uh, to, to the question by Dr. Lalliotis, um, the self-employed certainly includes professionals. Um, so this is this is clearly in in, in the data set. Uh, in th this is in in in, in the silk data. Uh, now we, we have focused more on the um, to, to to address the question by uh, my colleague Professor Luri. Um, we have focused more on wage earners because this has been the focus of what uh, these reforms would have, uh, what they would have liked to, 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 to achieve. Um, and the reform that happened in 2014, which was the decrease in this, because we had this uh, natural experiment in 2014, this actually took place for the wage uh, earners. Uh, we could actually run some additional simulations for other parts of the of, of the labor force, and uh, we will try to, to run uh, a number of those um, when we have the chance. But but that, but no no I don't know if it, the, the answer of uh, Professor Lurie is to do a, a relative comparison. Uh, no, we have not run this. 
Right, thanks, Nico. Uh, I'm trying to recover some of the, the questions that were asked previously because I don't have internet connection on my laptop, but uh, from my notes, um, uh, Vicky Price, uh, to who I sent my greetings, uh, asked um, if uh, on, the, on the basis of the results that you presented uh, in the grand scheme of things, um, the reforms were worth it. I think later she made a comment that the later results you, you showed seem to suggest that the answer is uh, is yes, or closer to the yes, but also Eric Klopfer, I think, uh, uh, MSC student at LSE, uh, asked more directly whether you think the internal devaluation strategy worked. I guess you answered that in relation to the cost competitiveness uh, aspect. But could you share some reflection a bit of, on the question of whether all this was worth the, the, the effort, the political upheaval, uh, the social pain, if we're talking, for example, about a change in labor force participation of 0.4 percentage point, uh, which is less than uh, 10 percent of what we would aspire, and um, you know, it, it was all this what happened over so many years uh, worth it in retrospect? Okay, let, let's try to be a little bit clear here about our thoughts. Uh, the, the one measurement we had was about what was. The, the, this one percent decrease in social security contributions in 2014, we documented and measured how much it increased um, participation in the labor force participation. We saw that it is sizable, significant. However, we saw that this is in some sense not enough. But this is not a surprise because the tax wedge in Greece is so significantly higher and it is still significantly higher, particularly for the wage earners than in most European countries. So, um, so all this may make sense. Now, you asked a much broader question, which is um, you asked if, if all this was worth it. Now, it depends on what you define as all this. Uh, the, you, you cannot, the Greece found itself in 2010, cut off from the international financial markets. So various types of adjustments uh, had to be made. Um, and those were on two fronts. The, you, you had to, to proceed with fiscal consolidation and then you had to proceed with structural reforms. And structural reforms actually had a number of sub subcategories. Uh, labor market reforms, product market reforms, um, public sector reforms. So let, let's actually see how these things interact. Could you actually have uh, adjustment in Greece without reforms in the labor market? In my view, you could not, and actually you should not. We, we have shown, the data shows very clearly that even before crisis, even in the good, in quote, years, uh, unemployment was high, the tax wedge was high, the informal sector was uh, very strong. And in fact, uh, and that's something that I would like to argue um, in terms of future research, um, the Greek labor markets were markets characterized a lot by an asymmetry between uh, insiders and uh, outsiders. Mm -hmm. um, and in particular, the outsiders includes uh, a lot those who uh, belong in the category of younger people as well as women. So these reforms uh, were needed. Now, the, the real question is the interaction. One of the things that we saw is that the fact that wages, the, the fact that disposable income went down because of the crisis actually uh, made it harder to strengthen the incentives for more labor force participation. In other words, yes, the cost of getting unemployed was high, but the cost of keeping your job actually was, uh, went down uh, as, as well. So that was one thing, obviously, if Greece could implement labor market reforms and other structural reforms without the fiscal consolidation, of course, the, the, the success and in terms of welfare would have been higher, but that was not possible. Okay? Yeah. 
Yeah. So that's that's that. Yeah. Okay, Nico. I'll move on to another couple of questions. So uh, Andreas Gidiadis, good colleague and author, um, also asks uh, whether because the, the reforms you presented or the variation you presented, other than the the one percentage point of the social security contributions, um, were seen as a bundle. Uh, so is there something to be said, especially with regard to kind of uh, future policy implications uh, about specific types of reforms, like the ones that you pre presented in the beginning of your presentation? So employment protection legislation, minimum wages, are you doing something which is more itemized, uh, if you want, uh, on that? Um, now, wait. The um, one thing that we estimated was the effect of this 2014 uh, one percentage point decrease. That's one. We also simulated between 2010 and 2018, the total effect of all the changes that we had that affected uh, disposable income. That was the second thing that we showed. And then when we went to the macro approach, we bundled uh, together all the effects that took place in 2012 and we ran a counter uh, factual. Now, one question is whether you can unbundle this bundle and basically yes. try to see um, what each of these reforms did. You, you cannot do this with a, with a macro approach, with a top-down approach. You could create, if you wanted, counterfactuals using, um, using Euro mode, if you wanted, and try to neutralize some of these uh, reforms and try to see what this does to the participation uh, tax rate. Although, many of these reforms would not directly affect that. So for instance, changes in the minimum wage do affect it, but changes in the collective bargaining uh, system, then it's hard to see how you would put this uh, across the data. This is more institutional. Yeah. Okay, very good. Sorry, I'm also joining through. So I'll come. Sorry, I hope this is now okay. You can hear me. I joined yes, back for, from my for computer. For a moment, I many, many to that you have to answer questions by both of you, Vasily. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, okay, so uh, another set of uh, questions uh, by Giuseppe Guerra, I, I think, and uh, Liz Mestenos uh, is about the vocational training, the vocational, uh, the dimension about vocational education. So uh, Giuseppe Guerra uh, says, whether vocational training is a solution to uh, impute, uh, obviously, in, uh, skills in the in the labor market and replace is that is that something to replace the the university entrance uh, sorry the, uh, exam system and push more from classical education I guess to uh, to vocational education. I think in the opposite direction. The second question by Mr. Stenos, Liz, I think. Uh, is uh, whether there's any evidence that the skills were needed by employers. So it's one thing to say that uh, we need more skills and the skill mismatches, but is there actual evidence that had these skills been available, especially, I guess, during the crisis, um, uh, they would have been used? And perhaps, may I add, also rewarded sufficiently by the employers? Right. Um... This, this is an issue that actually, in some sense, brings us towards uh, dynamics. Um, labor market participation decisions are not necessarily static. Uh, what type of uh, education I'm going to get is not necessarily a static decision. Um, and as well as uh, investment decisions on the, on the front of product markets. This also brings us a little bit to the question, to, you know, it, it, it's, it's a matter of chicken and egg. Basically, implicitly, the question asks, uh, right, so, but even if the people in the labor market had the skills, would they be able to find a job that is suitable for, for, for these skills? Okay, uh, first of all, there is a number, uh, so, so point, point one is that there is a number of studies um, that show that there is a mismatch. This is not actually a surprise. Uh, it, it's not a surprise because if you actually compare 
with uh, a number of other European countries. Greece is, a, is an outlier in the sense that its educational system prepares people at mo a lot more for people for employment in the, in the broader pu public sector. Uh, we, we, we can go through this, but a lot less for employment uh, in the industry. However, there was something implicit to the question that you conveyed, which was, yes, but if you put yourself in two th back in 2013 or 2014, would that have made much of a difference given the fact that the, you had this huge drop in demand, at least demand within the country, right? And then we discussed previously about demand from for exports. Now, it is true that for those that have been studying, you know, these 10 years of the Greek crisis, the number one thing that you, you have to describe, and it's really hard to evaluate its effect, but it was extremely dominant, was the, um, the burden of uncertainty about the future path of the country. Uh, those, of who, th those, th those of us who lived in Greece during these years, um, we went through this feeling that if you ask yourself three months from now, is the country still going to be here in one piece? You went through a number of years when the answer was, I'm not sure. So now what th this did a number of things, okay? It, it drove out incentives for investment. So investment in Greece started at 25% of GDP. It is still now lower than 12% of GDP. It drove out people with high human capital, the infamous um, brain drain. And in general, it acted as, um, it prohibited a number of structural uh, progress in a number of structural reforms. Because if you, if you have nothing to expect, at least you try to preserve what you now have. So this uncertainty was the number one factor. But the fact that this, and, and, and this was due to, uh, in, in my view, um, uh, an, an, an unfortunate uh, management by a number of, uh, pretty much everybody who contributed in, in this over the 10, ten, ten years. Having said that, this doesn't mean that uh, as economists, we should not evaluate the impact of various reforms. Um, and looking forward, because Greece, uh, if, 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 the Greek, if in the Greek economy, um, Greece, Greece cannot actually uh, go on without increased competitiveness looking forward in the next 10 years. And there are only two ways to do this. Either you are going to go through lower wages or you will be able to, to produce more competitive products that are actually um, higher quality and more innovative. In that sense, you have to make a list of reforms looking forward that are still pending. And it is important to think about the sequencing of these reforms and how they interact. So hopefully what we do contributes uh, in this exercise contributes towards that. Thanks, Nico. We've reached the time limit, but I think there is still some uh, active interest from the questions. So I would like to do a last round of uh, 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 questions. Actually, there's first two question suggestions by Stelio Sakas uh, from the European Commission, the Joint uh, Research uh, uh, Center, uh, who asks if you control somehow exactly for what you, you mentioned, the brain drain uh, in your analysis. So if the analysis controls for this kind of outflow of Presumably, presumably high-skilled uh, Greeks who left the country, and of course the labor force, and if that uh, affects your results. Also a question by George Kuchumanis, if you have looked in the synthetic control analysis on, on the impact on aggregate uh, GDP uh, or demand, if you looked at national level income, if you want, uh, effect. So this question is about uh, the analysis. Uh, a question by Maria Sukera uh, from the Athens University of Economics and Business, uh, uh, who says, looking at the forthcoming policy priorities, and you mentioned, the, you know, looking ahead with the policy questions, 
So in relation to the pension uh, reform, would the development of the third pillar help the labor market in Greece? In what way are we ready? So is the private sector, uh, I guess, uh, robust enough uh, uh, for that? So if you could say something about this, the, the third pillar in the pension uh, reforms, but also the questions about the analysis on, on GDP impact and the uh, uh, brain drain. Okay, uh, each one of those is a, <laughs> is, is, is a topic for deep analysis by itself. Um, in, in, in terms of, uh, of, of how you run uh, the, the macro analysis, yes, you do take uh, trends that take into account uh, GDP growth uh, in the controlled countries. Uh, that's how you create the counterfactuals. Um, regarding the first question by uh, Dr. Sakas, um, no, our analysis uh, does not take into account, um, on top of it, uh, the effect of the brain drain. Uh, you do this within the sample, and, and the sample is those who are in Greece. So, so the microanalysis is a simulation for those who have actually uh, stayed in the country, and it compares one margin which is, should I work in the formal sector or should I get unemployed? Uh, it might be interesting if you can actually have a more, uh, a richer and perhaps more dynamic decision, which is actually uh, where you should work. But, but for that, um, you, you know, th this is not actually measured in the characteristics of the households we have, um, they are collecting in the SILT data set. Um, Finally, there, there, is, there was the question about uh, the pension system. Um, you can actually see uh, in, in some of our analysis, um, currently the, um, the pension system in Greece, uh, has, the pension system in Greece has a, a number of features. Um, one is that uh, it is almost exclusively uh, public sector. Uh, so the private part of pensions is actually, even if you include the, pro the professional uh, funds, it's actually something like 4% of the total. So it's close to zero when in, in Europe it, it is more, it's a lot more. So one is that it's public sector. B is that it is, um, it is funded, it's, it's pay as you go. Um, it, it, it is pay as you go rather, rather than funded. So basically, this means that um, if you can, and, and, and what happened during this crisis, during the 10 years of the crisis, was that because of uh, two effects, which was the need for fiscal consolidation, uh, remember that Greece got into the crisis in 2008 or 9 with a primary budget surplus, uh, with a primary budget deficit of about 10% of GDP and the total deficits of about 15% of GDP. So the fiscal consolidation was not something you could avoid. And in addition, the pension system, along with the demographics, showed that it was actually not viable. So you had to intervene. However, one effect of that was that the average person actually at, at, at the end, during these programs, actually lost faith on the stability of the pension system. And uh, the average person, uh, whether currently a worker or a pensioner, um, actually starting believing that over the years, uh, their pensions is going to be less and less. So the, the country GDP goes down and their pensions uh, goes down even though it went down less than the GDP. Uh, now, what this does is that it creates a sense that my social security contributions, if in Greece I am a 25 years old working, so obviously not me, but a 25 year old working, this looks like taxation. So there isn't much of a link between what I'm gonna contribute and what I can anticipate I'm gonna get 30 or 40 years from now. So moving to a system with a strong um, second and third pillar for pensions, like what there is uh, in most European countries, in, in my view, is going to strengthen uh, incentives 
for uh, labor force participation, and it will gradually diminish the incentives to work in the informal sector. Muted. Uh, thanks, Nico, very much. I, I guess the question about the pension system is also about how the past, um, you know, the third pillar can be with the, the type of employers we 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 have in Greece and how sustainable some of the of the uh, funds would be. But I'm sure this is a, another uh, whole different debate that we can have and will continue to have uh, over time. Hopefully, with more projects uh, funded by the HSO and everything, we were able to. Uh, take all questions, including some by good colleagues. Greetings to Maria Tsiapa, Bernard Case, and Theo Papadopoulos, uh, uh, who I haven't seen for a while, but we weren't able to cover the questions. We ran out of uh, the beyond our allocated time, so we have to wrap it up here. On behalf of everybody, uh, Nico, thank you very much for the work you did on the project and, of course, for your uh, very interesting presentation and the, the discussion that followed. Thanks also to the audience and hopefully see you all in a future event by the Hellenic Observatory and the LSE. So let, let me also uh, e express my gratitude uh, for you for uh, having us and of course uh, to everybody for uh, participating and uh, me and uh, my colleagues because as I stress this is really joint work. Uh, we would be happy to continue this uh, discussion. We will in different ways uh, at different times. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Nico. Have a good evening.